Starship Flight 11 wasn't just another test. For the first time in the Starship program, SpaceX executed an entire mission without a single in-flight anomaly, structural issue, or major deviation from plan. Every objective was achieved exactly as intended, from liftoff to splashdown. Let's walk through the mission step-by-step step and see how Flight 11 became the most flawless Starship test yet. Flight 11, featuring Ship 38 and Booster 15, lifted off from Starbase on the evening of October 13th. Designed as a suborbital test, it was the final Block 2 launch, pushing upgrades and validating critical systems before the Block 3 transition. All 33 Raptor engines on Booster 15 performed nominally, with 24 flight-proven engines highlighting a milestone in reusability. The vehicle passed max Q roughly 62 seconds into flight, enduring maximum aerodynamic stress without structural flexing or disturbances, a sign of improved tank pressurization and load distribution. Stage separation was flawless. The outer and middle ring engines of the booster shut down. The three inner Raptors maintained thrust, and Ship 38 ignited its engines for hot staging. Vent blocks on the hot stage adapter redirected the ship's exhaust, ensuring a clean separation. Booster 15 then reignited 10 middle ring Raptors for the boost back burn. Although one engine failed to light, the remaining nine compensated automatically. Evidence of improved thrust vector control and real-time engine balancing algorithms. The booster then jettisoned its hot stage ring to reduce mass for descent. This was the final mission to use a separable ring. Starting with Block 3, the structure will be fully integrated into the booster, reducing complexity and improving reusability. Instead of a tower catch attempt, SpaceX opted for a controlled splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico, a cautious decision allowing engineers to focus purely on engine dynamics and descent control without risking launch site infrastructure. During descent, Booster 15 executed a highly instrumented landing sequence designed to test new control logic and redundancy features for future tower catches. It began the landing burn using 13 engines, including the one that previously failed during boost back, which reignited successfully, indicating the earlier issue wasn't hardware related, but likely due to a transient propellant flow imbalance. The booster then entered a five engine divert phase using three inner and two mid ring Raptors to refine its trajectory. In previous missions, the booster used a three-engine configuration for this phase, but the new five-engine setup adds redundancy against unplanned engine shutdowns. For final deceleration, the booster switched to three center engines, briefly hovering above the gulf before performing a soft splashdown. The entire landing sequence provided critical aerodynamic and control data, especially on how the booster transitions through each phase of thrust reduction and hands-off control between engine clusters. This data will directly feed into future tower catch attempts with Block 3 boosters. Meanwhile, Ship 38 continued its climb flawlessly. All six Raptor engines performed nominally throughout ascent. The recurring thermal hotspots seen on the Raptor vacuum nozzles during previous flights were absent, confirming improved regenerative cooling and thermal shielding. At around nine minutes into flight, all engines shut down as planned, placing the vehicle into a suborbital coast. During coast, the ship executed several key test objectives, starting with deploying eight Starlink simulators. The ship reoriented using its reaction control system thrusters to achieve the proper attitude for release and then successfully opened the payload bay door, preparing for Starlink deployment. These simulators, designed as dummy masses replicating the size and weight of next-generation Starlink satellites, were released sequentially over six minutes into suborbital trajectories, closely matching the ship's path validating the dispenser's reliability for future orbital deployments. The clearance issue seen in Flight 10, where two dummy payloads collided with the bay door during release, was fully resolved, confirming the effectiveness of the updated dispenser operation and deployment sequence. After all simulators were deployed, the payload bay door closed securely, verifying its operation and ensuring a proper seal for re-entry. Approximately 38 minutes into the flight, a sea-level Raptor engine reignited using propellant from the header tanks for a five-second burn. This successful in-space restart demonstrated Starship's capability for controlled deorbit burns during orbital missions and marked the third consecutive flawless Raptor relight in space. The ship continued its flight while preparing for atmospheric re-entry. In Flight 10, a propellant accumulation in the engine bay caused an explosion just before re-entry a critical issue that SpaceX engineers addressed after the mission. For Flight 11, the venting schedule for both methane and oxygen was completely reworked.
Instead of simultaneous venting, staggered timing ensured that propellants were expelled gradually, preventing any volatile vapor buildup near the engines. This fix highlights how SpaceX treats every failure as a data point, systematically learning from each incident to refine and improve its systems. As the ship hit denser atmospheric layers, it began glowing with frictional plasma. The vehicle entered at a steep angle of attack to maximize thermal load across the heat shield, deliberately pushing the limits of the new tile bonding system. To study worst-case scenarios, SpaceX intentionally left sections of the hull without tiles, exposing the pyron ablative underlayer and KO wool insulation directly to re-entry heating. In some areas, even these protective layers were removed, leaving bare stainless steel exposed to plasma, a bold stress test to observe how the ship's primary structure handles transient heating and ablation. Interestingly, tiles were installed on the leeward side of both aft flaps, a region that doesn't experience the intense re-entry heating, to test upgraded attachment pins planned for Block 3 starships. These pins are engineered to withstand flight-induced stresses and vibrations rather than high re-entry temperatures. So installing tiles on the leeward side lets engineers evaluate the pin's performance, durability, and installation under realistic conditions without impacting critical areas of the vehicle. Flight 10 had closely spaced tiles on the flaps, while Flight 11 used a staggered chessboard-like pattern. This flight also validated the redesigned forward flaps and reinforced aft flaps of the Block 2 vehicle. The aerodynamic surfaces endured intense thermal and pressure loads, confirming that the new hinges and thermal coatings could handle both. Additionally, non-structural catch fittings for the future chopstick catch system were installed, exposing them directly to re-entry plasma. This provided baseline data on how the mounts tolerate extreme heating before experiencing mechanical stresses during tower capture in future missions. The most visually striking moment of Flight 11 came when Ship 38 performed its dynamic banking maneuver around 55 kilometers altitude. The ship rolled side to side, redirecting its lift vector laterally rather than upward. This kept it deeper in the atmosphere longer, maximizing drag and refining trajectory control. As it neared the landing zone, Ship 38 executed a wide-looping turn, a maneuver future orbital ships will use to bleed velocity for a safe tower catch. This is conceptually similar to the S-Turn's space shuttles performed before landing, which shed orbital speed and transition to subsonic flight before using ailerons, rudder, and elevons to glide and flare for touchdown on the runway. Although Starship will not land on a runway and will instead be caught by the tower arms, the banking maneuver and the loop around the landing site to bleed velocity follow the same aerodynamic principles as the shuttle. By modulating flaps and body attitude, Starship directs the lift vector sideways, fine-tunes its trajectory, increases drag, manages heating, and slows efficiently. Starship's exact control algorithms, including bank angles and S-turn equivalents, differ from the shuttles and are specifically tailored to its aerodynamic design, velocity, and orientation. Data from this banking maneuver, along with similar maneuvers in upcoming test flights, will help SpaceX refine Starship's re-entry trajectory, orientation, and velocity, enhancing precision, thermal control, and alignment for future tower catches. Near the ocean surface, Ship 38 reignited its sea-level raptors for the landing burn, performing the signature flip maneuver to transition from horizontal belly flop to vertical orientation. The vehicle then completed a soft splashdown in the Indian Ocean, marking the most stable and controlled descent and landing sequence ever achieved by a Starship vehicle. Overall, Flight 11 wasn't a repetition of Flight 10. It was a full validation campaign. The Block 2 design proved itself with stable ascent, precise separation, booster splashdown, successful payload deployment, clean in-space relight, fault-free coast, re-entry, and a controlled landing, all without anomalies. Every second of telemetry from Flight 11 will feed into the next phase of Starship's evolution, refining control systems, validating thermal models, and perfecting tower catch precision. NASA's acting administrator, Sean Duffy, described Flight 11 as a major step toward landing astronauts on the moon's south pole, emphasizing that SpaceX's progress is critical for the Artemis missions. Shanna Diaz, SpaceX's Director of Starship Flight Reliability, highlighted the key lessons learned from Flight 11 regarding the heat shield and the precise landing maneuvers required to catch a Starship with the tower arms next year. This mission closed the chapter on Block 2 prototypes and opened the path for the operational Block 3 era, starting with Flight 12, where full reusability and orbital recovery become the focus. 
the vehicles in line for Flight 12 are Ship 39 and Booster 18, both at different stages of assembly at the production site. After finishing the heat tile installation, Ship 39's nose cone and payload bay assembly was recently transferred into Mega Bay 2 for stacking with its remaining tank sections. Meanwhile, Booster 18 is taking shape in Mega Bay 1, where its lower liquid oxygen tank section is complete, and work has now shifted to the methane tank stack. If assembly continues at this pace, both vehicles could be fully integrated, complete ground tests, and be ready for Flight 12 by early next year. However, vehicle readiness is only one part of the equation. The bigger hurdle before Flight 12 is the launch infrastructure. Starship Flight 12 will not launch from Pad 1's orbital launch mount, which is incompatible with the Block 3 design. The Pad 1 OLM will soon be demolished and rebuilt to match Pad 2's upgraded configuration. Once those upgrades are complete, Pad 1 will resume supporting launch and catch operations. But until then, Pad 2 will handle all Starship flights. Now. Let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. China's Gravity-1 rocket ignited from its ocean-based barge on October 11th, propelling three satellites into orbit and underscoring the precision of sea-launched rocketry. Orion Space, the private Chinese aerospace firm behind Gravity-1, was founded in 2020 with a focus on developing cost-effective launch vehicles and engines to meet the growing demands of commercial space operations. Gravity-1 is the company's first orbital launch vehicle an expendable, solid propellant, medium lift launcher optimized for deploying satellite constellations into orbit. Standing 30 meters tall with a 4.2 meter fairing, it features four side-mounted solid rocket boosters that ignite on the launch pad, while the three stages of the central core ignite sequentially during flight with each stage firing after the previous one separates. Together, these seven solid stages make Gravity One the world's first all-solid, medium-class launch vehicle. The rocket can carry payloads of up to 6.5 tons to low Earth orbit and 4.2 tons to sun-synchronous orbit, enabling the deployment of large-scale satellite constellations. Gravity One launches from a floating platform typically stationed off Haiyang Port in the Yellow Sea between China and the Korean Peninsula. The platform is engineered for stability amid ocean waves and can withstand the rocket's 5,880 kilonewton liftoff thrust. The ocean launch approach offers major advantages. It enhances safety by avoiding densely populated areas, enables optimal orbital inclinations, and allows better use of Earth's rotational velocity through near-equatorial launches. It also allows flexible trajectories without overflying sensitive regions, minimizes environmental impact on coastal ecosystems, and streamlines logistics for rapid launch schedules. Gravity One's maiden flight in January 2024 successfully deployed three Yunyao-1 meteorological satellites into low Earth orbit. The second mission, on October 11th, carried the Jilin-1 wideband Earth observation satellite designed for mineral resource and land use monitoring, along with two Shutian Yuxing spacecraft built to detect, monitor, and image orbital debris, including inactive satellites and abandoned rocket stages. All three payloads were inserted into a sun-synchronous orbit at approximately 540 kilometers altitude. Another Gravity One launch is scheduled later this year with yet-to-be-disclosed payloads. Orion Space is also developing Gravity Two and Gravity Three, which will incorporate liquid propulsion, complete reusability, and enhanced capabilities for deep space and planetary missions. Complementing these rockets is the company's Force Engine series a liquid oxygen kerosene gas generator cycle engine currently under development for use in future gravity vehicles. Together, these efforts position Orient Space as one of China's leading private launch providers, driving innovation in cost-effective and flexible orbital access. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.